Hello everyone, my name is Natalia Taylor and this is my testimony from New Age to Jesus. I've been more open about my relationship with God on my channel recently and since I've been on YouTube, I think I started back in 2015, some of my subscribers have seen my journey and how I've gone from here to here and I, I wanted to make an official video uh, about my testimony going from New Age spirituality to God and uh, that's what this video is going to be. So I want to give a couple disclaimers. This might be a long video. I'm going to kind of try and keep the editing minimum since it's a lot and I'm going to be getting into a lot. I actually had to make a whole note on my iPad to remember everything. So there's going to be minimal editing and maybe this is something you want to watch in the background while you're doing something else or you have the time to just sit down for however long this is going to be. The second disclaimer is I am going to be talking about God in this video. I seem to have some people that are still hanging around, subscribers that don't really know that I'm a I'm a Christian, that I love Jesus now, and so I need to put that out there that I'm going to be talking about Jesus in this video. Um, the third disclaimer is in this video, I'll also be touching on some sensitive topics such as drug use and suicide. So if those are things that you don't really want to hear about or it's going to trigger you to the point where you're not going to feel good after this video, then maybe consider watching something else or coming back when you're ready. But this is going to be a really awesome <laughs> video because I've talked about my testimony before in a couple different lenses, but never through a full spiritual lens. I've never actually like been so open about my spirituality on my channel as I am now. So that's what this video is. My story from new age to Jesus. When I was young, as many of you know, I experienced quite a bit of trauma. And one of the major things that happened to me was I was abducted by my biological father as a kid. Now, Trauma has a really funny way of like affecting everyone differently. So the way that I coped with trauma as a young girl was by actually trying to control fear. So when situations happened to me that were out of my control, like getting abducted or experiencing abuse or witnessing abuse, it felt scary and out of my control. So I wanted to cope by controlling fear. And there were a few different ways that I tried to control fear. The first way was getting super into scary movies as a kid. So I loved horror films by the age of like eight or nine. I would just love being able to control the, when I could be scared and be able to turn it off. And then I would feel like I have the power back, if that makes sense. The second way that I would control fear would be by telling my friends scary stories. I loved like campfire stories that were spooky. I loved ghost stories and they always left me kind of feeling like the hero at the end. Uh, another thing was haunted houses. I really loved scaring myself in haunted houses. That was another way for me to control fear. Um, and another way was by being kind of the daredevil in my friend group. Uh, whenever we would play truth or dare. I always wanted to be the one that would do the dare because I was fearless. You know, I wanted to show fear that I could conquer it, even though deep down I felt out of control because of the things that made me scared in my childhood, if that makes sense. And one of the big things that really fascinated me were Ouija boards. And I feel like the Ouija board is kind of like a big part of my testimony. So on my channel back in 2015, when I started YouTube, I uploaded a video talking about an experience that I had with a Ouija board. And I'm going to give a brief summary of it just because I feel like it's necessary for this testimony. I am not trying to glorify the devil in this video. However, the devil did use me and my name to lead people into darkness for many years, so I don't mind using him and his name to lead people to goodness now. But I do believe for me personally, I met the devil before I met God, and it was through many things, but first was this experience in college that I had with a Ouija board. 
So just to summarize this experience with the Ouija board. So me being the daredevil friend that I was back then, I tried to introduce my roommate at the time and my boyfriend at the time to Ouija boards. And I had played with one before like a few years back, but nothing really happened. So I wasn't really scared and I was ready to prove that I wasn't scared to everyone around me since that's how I was coping. So we got out the Ouija board and we started playing around with it, asking it questions, and I asked it to possess me. <laughs> Back then, I, I really didn't know what I was dealing with. I didn't know the spiritual ramifications of Ouija boards. I thought it was just stupid and there was nothing really behind it. And at that time, my roommate and I had just finished watching the whole season of American Horror Story Coven. So the mindset that I was in when we were playing with the Ouija board was kind of a dark mindset already. And I look back and obviously I know now that it was influenced, but I was kind of just ready for anything. So I just asked the Ouija board, can you just possess me? I dare you, I dare you to possess me. And uh, yeah, looking back, that wasn't a good idea. But what ended up happening was it possessed my roommate. So my roommate, her whole arm had gotten possessed. And this was in a time where I didn't really believe anything spiritually. I was in a mindset of trying to break into the entertainment industry, okay? I was in college. I was doing the college thing, but I wasn't really pursuing college seriously. I really wanted to be a model. I wanted to be an actor. And so, like, I wasn't pursuing God. I wasn't in church or anything like that. So when my roommate got possessed, I didn't have the spiritual knowledge to understand what was happening to her arm, um, but her arm was out of control and it was like twitching. It was throwing up derogatory hand symbols. I'm not gonna like do it in this video, but it was scary. And the the knowledge that I had was from all the scary movies that I had watched. I, I was referencing the horror films that I grew up watching. And I remember thinking to myself, this is where they get horror films from. It's from real life. It's not from imagination. It's not from, it's not from, you know, coming up with it just out of the blue. It's, it's real. Um, and so I didn't know what to do. I, I, of course, most people think, you know, if, if you believe in the demonic, if you believe in the devil, then you have to believe in God. But my first reaction wasn't to run to God. My first reaction was, my friend needs to go to the hospital. My friend needs to go to the hospital. Something's going on. So we drove her to the hospital. A few things happened in between that I won't get into, but we took her there and my boyfriend at the time had brought the Ouija board with us and we decided to try and open it up one last time. And we asked it what was going on, who was controlling my friend's arm and it spelled out the word Diavola. Uh, apparently diavola in latin is like root for female devil female devil i i know that it was it was a devil a, a demon or a devil or satan that was possessing my roommate at that time and i didn't know that i just like thought she was crazy or something which is why we took her to the hospital eventually um and so we basically told the ouija board we believe that you're real we believe the devil is real we believe in the demonic and we're not going to mess with Ouija boards ever again. And her arm stopped going crazy. And that was that. My boyfriend broke the Ouija board, threw it in a dumpster. I don't know if that's what you're, you're supposed to do. Some people say you're supposed to burn it. Honestly, I don't really care. Um, but that's just what happened. We got rid of it. And that was the beginning of my walk with Satan. Back then in 2014, I didn't even realize that that was a demonic agreement that I had made. When I asked the Ouija board to possess me, I mean, I know now that that is the beginning of the opening to when Satan came into my life and started just changing everything. I mean, that was the catalyst. My life just immediately started changing after this experience. I had dropped out of college. Crazy things were happening in my apartment. Things were moving. Something actually crawled into my bed with me while I was sleeping. I thought it was my boyfriend and I look and there was nothing there. Um, there were just a lot of things that you'd think would send me running to God, but unfortunately it did the opposite. It made me 
feel like I just wanted nothing to do with the spirit world at all. And the way that I coped with that was by trying to ignore it and by running further into my career and wanting to become a model. So I dropped out of college and started picking up more modeling gigs. And after that, I mean, a couple months have gone by and modeling isn't really going well for me. So things are slowing down. I'm kind of at a standstill. I'm like, you know, I dropped out of college for my career. At my, in my mind at that time, I thought I, I had made the decision. I had made the decision to go in this direction, okay? Like my life was going downwards because of me, but really it was the spiritual agreement that I had made. But anyways, that's when I decided to start my YouTube channel. And I believe the first video I uploaded is in 2015. And I uploaded a couple videos on this channel and no one really watched them. <laughs> like I wasn't getting any views. No one really cared. I, I think like the first video I uploaded was about like being <laughs> a Jimmy John's driver. Like I used to work at Jimmy John's or something like that. And then something came over me one day and I thought, you know, I'm sitting on a really crazy story about this Ouija board experience without even knowing the depth of what that really was. Just thinking, how can I capitalize on this? If that has any context of where my mindset was at that time. It wasn't, this is scary. This is crazy. Um, I need to repent. <laughs> I need to find God. No, my mindset was, how can I make money off of this? How can I get attention from this? How can I gain popularity by telling this story? And even now, like I, when I talk about it, I, I laugh because, because it's traumatic. It was a very traumatic thing that happened witnessing my roommate have a possession like it was scary so when I tell it I don't even fully remember it it's like I've suppressed parts of it but I decided to film a video like I said prior to making this video no one really watched my channel I mean maybe a couple of my friends or a few of my Instagram followers paid attention but it wasn't until after I uploaded the Ouija board story time video on my YouTube channel that it got over a million views, maybe multiple millions. I don't remember, but I do remember that that's when I gained my first 200,000 subscribers. And it's kind of weird because spiritually you would see that as a red flag, right? You would see that as a spiritual red flag. But because of my coping mechanisms from when I was a child all the way up until now, because I had to suppress my actual feelings for so many years, I was actually suppressing even the feelings of red flags, even the feelings of this isn't right. I couldn't even tell. I didn't even know. I was just happy that I was finally getting the attention and the popularity that I thought I always deserved. And that was my religion, okay? Popularity, power, uh, money, fame, that was what I wanted more than anything. My entire being had become a product of my trauma. My entire identity was reactionary to the negative things that had happened to me. And I found that identity in being a victim of life, being the person that exposes the liars and the cheaters of the world. Um, darkness really still had a funny way of telling me who I was. Because I was so hurt from my past, because I was so traumatized from the way I grew up and the bullying that I experienced, I was vengeful. I was really vengeful and I really wanted to prove a point to everyone that had ever told me otherwise or bullied me or hurt me. I wanted to prove that I had worth and value. So when I started to gain traction and popularity, that's when it started filling the hole. It's not like someone just wakes up one day and says, I just want to identify as someone that follows darkness. That's not how it works. The way that it works is someone steals from you and you decide, I'm never letting anyone in my house ever again. Someone lies to you and you decide, oh, I'm never going to trust anyone ever again. Or maybe someone hurts you and you decide, I can never feel anything ever again. So it's a reaction. And the way that it's causing you to change 
is when you become a cold, lonely person that lives alone and you're living in darkness before you even know it. So that was me. I was a creation of what my trauma had made me. I had reacted and responded to it in a way to protect myself as a survivor mechanism, survival mechanism. I, I had to become cold to survive, if that makes sense. Like, I don't know if you guys have ever seen the things on social media that are like, become the coldest version of yourself, girlfriend, or whatever. It's like trying to glorify being like, you know, a cold bitch, basically. Um, to try and protect yourself because so many people have hurt you that you're like, well, if I'm the boss of my own world, then no one can hurt me at least. And that is a very slippery slope. It's very dangerous, especially when it's like so popular online and it's kind of like we're influencing each other to become colder and harsher and um, act like we're better than everyone else. I mean, that's just where I was at the time thinking, you know, everyone's hurt me. Everyone's effed me over so I might as well live my best life f everyone else and do me and in the meantime I can prove how much better I am than everyone else and I since then I have repented of that mindset and I see things a lot differently now but that's how it got started and the biggest thing for me was wanting fame i wanted fans and when i had fans i loved having fans because when people strangers that didn't even know me loved me and showed me compassion and they would post pictures of me saying how much they loved me even though they didn't really know me um it made me feel like i had worth and i could prove to my father that abducted me. I could prove that all the people that bullied me were wrong. And it filled my heart temporarily with a fake love, a, a false sense of love. Yeah, those people supported me. And I definitely appreciate that now, you know, all the people that supported me since the beginning. But it wasn't true love. I mean, it wasn't where I needed to seek my validation by any means. And I think I was always, since the beginning, extremely unsatisfied with the way the world was. I was always unsatisfied with humanity and I always looked at humanity as a bitter person would look at it as broken, as dirty, as like effed up. And I didn't think there was really a solution. I thought people are terrible and humans are terrible. So I might as well just protect myself. And I, I look back now and I never even realized that it wasn't people that I hated, it was sin. It was the sin of the world that made humanity so effed up. And of course, I had no idea that there was someone that came to solve that. I didn't even know anything about that. So I continued to follow my religion, popularity, success, money. And as far as Christianity was concerned, I mean, it was a world away. It, it didn't even cross my mind ever. Jesus never once crossed my mind. I think maybe like, maybe my mom would bring it up to me because my mom is a believer. I mean, we never regularly went to church or anything, but I, my mom asked me one day, you know, are, are you a believer of, in God? And I told her straight up, no, I don't believe there's a God. <laughs> like if there's a God, why are there so many terrible things in the world, you know? And why are so many Christians hypocrites? That was the way that I saw it. So no, Jesus never crossed my mind. And I didn't like how Christians were so closed minded. I didn't like how Christianity said, Jesus is the only way, right? Like I didn't think that that was very open-minded of them. I thought that was very uninclusive. And I thought, how close-minded do you have to be to tell someone else that their experience is invalid? That, that was my, the way that I thought. I mean, I feel like that is a very common way of thinking. And I still to this day understand when people ask that. I, I still get that. And I think it's easy to think that, especially if you've never encountered Jesus and the love that he is. Uh, so that that's the way I was thinking. So no, I, I didn't like Christianity. It was too close-minded for me. And after I achieved worldly success and worldly power, that's when I really started craving spiritual power. And this was around the age of 20. And the lifestyle that I was living during this time was a lot of partying, a lot of traveling, you know, going from city to city and doing drugs like, I mean, just smoking weed and doing a little bit of cocaine. But I 
started dabbling into psychedelics a little bit more. And when I started doing psychedelics, that's when I started opening myself up to the spiritual realm a little bit more. I remember the first time I ever dropped acid, I felt like an anxiety. And anyone that's done drugs like this will tell you that it's normal. Like this is what always happens. There's always like an anxiety in the beginning and it takes you through this experience. And it, my first time, it literally felt like <laughs> I was not in control. Like a being was there controlling my experience and like dragging me through this experience where I, <laughs> it's literally called drug. Like I was being drugged, dragged, drag, drug through this experience and it's funny because I started vomiting profusely for over an hour. I look back and I realize that was my body trying to purge the darkness that I was encountering. But at the time, I didn't think that it was darkness. It felt like truth. It felt like light. And it's so funny how the enemy comes as an angel of light and he disguises himself as the truth when really it's not the truth. And so psychedelics, you know, it kind of left me feeling intrigued. It left me feeling curious. It felt like I wanted to go down the rabbit hole and it got darker and darker from there. This is when synchronicities and angel numbers and things like that started entering my life. And I started realizing, wow, there are higher beings out there um, that are controlling space and time. And that is true. That is 100% true. There are higher beings than us, powers and principalities, but they are not of God and they are of darkness. And the Bible says very specifically that we are not fighting against flesh and blood, but of powers and principalities of, of darkness. And at the time, I just felt like, oh, well, these are my spirit guides. And, you know, everywhere I looked, I would see angel numbers, which in and of themselves are not inherently bad. But when you're starting to receive messages from you know things beyond time and space there are things out there that can control things and align things that are not out for your good and when you start dabbling into acid or mushrooms or psychedelics or anything like that you are opening windows and you're agreeing to allow those things in so the way that spirit the spiritual world works, right? This is just a sidetrack. The way the spiritual world works here on earth is by human agreement. Spiritual realms and spiritual beings need human agreement to act out their will on the earth through people. And so it's the same with God. God needs you to say yes to him for him to work his will through you. But through the demonic, when you are taking drugs, it's essentially you putting your signature on that. You're giving your agreement. It's an act of saying yes to that spiritual power and that spiritual principle. So after you say yes, then those things can start coming into your life, even after the drug experience is long gone. And like I said, this is how these things work. They come into your life and they kind of disguise themselves as light and you realize that it's beyond you. It's above you and beyond you. And you kind of see that as something in God's place. Like you're putting something in God's place just because you don't understand it. And it's like the God of the gap, right? The gap of understanding. You're putting some, something in that just because you don't understand it, you're calling it God. And so that's kind of like what I was doing at this time with New Age. And, and I started really reading into it. And I really liked it. I liked the identity of being able to communicate with the spirit realm and having things, you know, synchronize in my life and weird coincidences happening to me. And I started getting into other new age practices like meditation, chakras, um, of course, psychedelics, mantras, crystals, tarot cards, and especially karma. Like I was super into karma. And karma made sense to me, right? Karma makes sense. You put out good, you get good back. You put out bad, you get bad back. Of course, I know now that I had no idea what good even was. I mean, at that time, good was just my, what I had formed based on my own experiences, right? Like my good is going to be completely different than my neighbor's good because they've had a completely different life than me. So I was just like believing karma based off of like whatever I had made up in my mind. 
and I wasn't basing good off of the one who is truly good, which is God and Jesus. Like no matter what you do, you can never truly grasp goodness. You can't just like define it other than how, who God defines himself to be, which he is the one that's pure and good. So if karma is real and, and you know, what you put out, you get back, then it kind of clicks. You realize, okay, I'm putting out what I think is good, which isn't actually good, right? So I'm going to get bad back if even if I think I'm putting good out. So like my bad karma wasn't something I could fix no matter how good I tried to be. I was always going to have bad karma and that's sin and that's realizing you need a savior. So that's something that I realized down the road that I actually needed Jesus and that I needed a sacrifice for all of my bad karma that I wasn't intentionally putting out or my sins, the sins that I was you know, essentially born into because this world is a fallen world. But that's another thing that Christianity kind of like always turned me off because I wasn't into the whole sacrifice thing. I didn't believe that, you know, a dying guy on a stick was like something I wanted to resonate with. I just felt like that was bad vibes, bro. You know, <laughs> so that was the missing piece that I never fully understood uh, when it came to Jesus and why a sacrifice, a perfect sacrifice or a lamb of God was required for humans to be united with him. Um, but that just took a little bit of history that I needed to research. And that just took a little bit more understanding for that gap of understanding to be bridged. And now, and now I understand Jesus is actually great vibes. Okay. <laughs> but back to our timeline, I was still just searching and searching and I found my identity in the searching for the wisdom. I mean, it was like I was almost lost. And I find that, you know, when you talk to anyone that practices new age spirituality, they're very open and they're very loving people. And I have to say, they're some of the most loving and accepting people, but there's no truth that they stand on. Like I had no truth to anything I believed. I mean, if someone would have asked me, what is it you believe? I would have said, well, you know, I don't really know. I don't really have any truth. Like the truth is just love and the truth is peace. You know, it's just like kind of building a foundation on sand, sinking sand. But like deep inside me, I was still that little girl trying to figure out the world. Deep inside, I was still, you know, the eight-year-old me that has gone through all this trauma that didn't really know how to cope with it to begin with. I, I just had tried to survive all of these years, trying to cope, trying to survive and somehow find my place in this world, find my purpose in this world. And so that's why I started identifying more with New Age and seeking you know, finding my identity in the seeking and getting help from someone out of this freaking world because no one in this world wanted to help me. Everyone in this world wanted to hurt me. So, you know, I turned to the spiritual realm and I really liked identifying with new age too, because I think the vanity in me liked the way it looked. Like I kind of liked the aesthetic of new age with the crystals, you know, they're really pretty. And I, I, I liked how pretty and glittery New Age looked. Like I just keep thinking back, like that's just the little girl in me. The little girl in me wanted something pretty and cute to identify with. While I was practicing New Age, I was trying to avoid religion. That's ultimately what I was trying to do. Find my identity and avoid religion while I was at it because I didn't like religion. I didn't like people that were in church. And it's funny because while I was simultaneously avoiding religion, I was creating my own. My new age practices had gotten ironically religious. I would wait for a full moon and put my crystals out in a full moon to charge. I would say mantras out loud before I did psychedelics. I would wake up every morning at 6 a.m. to meditate with my spirit guides and try and leave my body, try and astral project. And it was a religion. Like I had created my own rituals and my own religion. The only difference was it was solitary. I was the God of my own life. I wasn't going to submit my ego to what the popular opinion was. That's what it is. I didn't want to be mainstream. I wanted to be individual. I wanted to be in control. Now this all came to a head when I went to a music festival in 2017 and I decided to do Molly and Acid at the same time. 
And I've talked about this experience in another video a little less in depth than I am in this video. I'm talking more like in detail about the specific drugs and stuff because I don't really care about monetization anymore. Like I'm set up my money in other ways like other than social media. So now I'm raw, like I'm here to be raw with you. And this is real, this is what happened. And so if maybe there's someone out here watching that has had the exact same experience and they, you know, can relate. So I decided to do that and everything changed. This experience actually broke my brain. I also forgot to mention on the way to this music festival, I had to have my friends take me to the hospital because I had such a bad anxiety attack in the car. I was driving and I felt so much anxiety that I couldn't even drive and my friends had to take over the car and take me to the hospital. And after that, I still didn't even understand that that was a big spiritual red flag. Also, another crazy thing that happened before this experience, right before we left my house for the festival, the thing that we had saved of drugs that we were going to bring mysteriously went missing. I now believe that that was an angel or God trying to prevent this terrible scenario from happening. But unfortunately, we were able to buy drugs at the music festival. This time, the dark energy that was dragging me along through this experience wasn't even pretending to be of the light anymore. It was full blown darkness. And it was almost coming to me like a voice, not like an audible voice, but I was getting these signs that were communicating to me while I was on this experience at this festival. And it was like telling me that I needed to kill myself. It was like this voice, this demonic dark voice that was like, you are going to live eternally you're going to have eternal life, but the only way you can transcend this life and pass on into the next life for you to start a new life or a new creation is for you to kill yourself and commit suicide. And you have to surpass that fear of not wanting to kill yourself. And you just have to do it in order for you to excel or like... <laughs> evolve <laughs> does that make sense i mean i know all of this sounds absolutely insane like i know it sounds crazy because it is it's wild right um drugs are wild don't do them um but yeah this voice was showing me signs of killing myself like i was in a crowd watching a show at this music festival and someone had a blow-up doll with like a, ne a thing around its neck like hanging like this on a stick and like the entity was like you need to do that. You need to hang yourself. You need to die. You don't forget. You need to do this by the end of the day. It was like a weird, that weird voice in you. That's like, by the end of the day, you better kill yourself. Don't forget. And it's weird. Like I, <laughs> I look back on that and I'm like, that is so dark. And like, I would walk through all of these different booths and one booth was like a crystal booth. And I was super into crystals at the time. Like I said, so I picked up this crystal and it was like a skull. And for some reason, when I looked at the skull, some voice told me like, that's the sign of death. That's your death coming. And like the way that I coped was through actually contemplating doing it. <laughs> I actually thought I need to do this. Um, God, I'm glad I didn't. Thank you, God. <laughs> uh, I was coping with it by that, but also then I would have moments where I'm like, this is just a bad trip. This is just a bad trip. I need to wait this out. Uh, I'm going to go back to the camp and just wait this out and see if it goes away. And then I would contemplate it again and then it would go away. And then I would like think, well, I could just sneak off into the woods right now and do it and no one would know. And then it would go away. And I finally, finally made the decision. Like, I'm just going to wait this out. <laughs> this feels like a bad trip. Um, and then it happened. The trip never ended. The trip never ended. The hallucinations went away for the most part, but the actual feeling and the voice, the demonic voice didn't go away. Like it was so bad. I actually had to leave the music festival early, like a day or two early. And when I got home, things did not get better. I was completely uh, incapacitated. I forgot how to work my YouTube camera. I couldn't edit any YouTube videos. I could barely form normal sentences. All I could really do was stay in my house. I couldn't see anyone unless it was like a weed dealer or something. 
and I had to color in my coloring book. That is where my mind was. I, I had broken my brain to the point where I was in a drug induced psychosis, um, hearing voices, demonic voices, and stuck watching cable television, coloring in a coloring book, like I was in a psych ward. And even sometimes like when I would watch cable television, like voices would talk to me through the television and it wasn't a hallucination. It wasn't like I saw a being come through the television or anything like that. The hallucinations had pretty much gone away, but it would be like, I would, I would hear something say, you need to kill yourself. You need to kill yourself. And then like something would pop up on the television, like a TV show. And it would be like, yeah, suicide or something like that. And it was like one of those synchronistic events where once I had worshiped that, once I had put that in the place of my God, it was like what was outside of the of earth, the realm outside of time and space where these spirit guides, these spiritual beings that I had let into my life, I had worshiped them and they were good to me up until this point where they're like, okay, kill yourself. Those were the messages that I was then receiving while I was in psychosis. And it wasn't just through the television. Sometimes it was through the radio. So it's like, what do you do in that situation? What do you do when you are convinced you're crazy? You're convinced that whatever's talking to you is God. I mean, I felt like it was God. It, I didn't call it God, but it was like my spirit guide telling me to kill myself to ascend. <laughs> Helpless. Helplessness. And if you're wondering, why didn't you go get help? I tried to get help on my own by going to a psychiatrist. And the things that I'm explaining in this video, I explained to the psychiatrist. And obviously she told me that these are symptoms from the drug-induced psychosis that I needed to be on an antipsychotic. I started taking an antipsychotic called Geodon. And that antipsychotic made things worse. Now, when I took my antipsychotic medication, I wasn't allowed to leave my house after 6 p.m. because then I couldn't drive or operate heavy machinery. So now I'm trapped in this place where I can't come or go as I please. I feel like like walls are being put around me, like I'm in a cell of my own head and my own insanity and I can't get out. I truly believe I was in my personal hell, my personal hell. And what happened next is shocking and amazing and can't even fully be put into words, but I'm going to try and explain it. Things from the Bible, particularly the story of Noah and the ark, started making themselves known to me. So the way that I would like see signs from this energy telling me to kill myself or whatever, I would start hearing a different voice. And this voice was not telling me to kill myself. I'm just going to try my best to explain it through specific examples. So I remember one day I was able to leave the house because I wanted to pick up some weed from my weed dealer, but he had like lived at a different house. He like moved or something. So we went to his new house and it was across the street from where I had gone to daycare as a kid. And the daycare that I went to as a kid uh, was a Christian daycare, which is really funny because I wasn't like really raised Christian. I just like went to a Christian daycare because like my mom wanted me to go there, um, even though we didn't regularly, regularly go to church. But I remember pulling up to my weed dealer's house and across the street at the, <laughs> the Christian daycare, they have like on their playground, a big wooden ark from Noah's Ark. And for some reason, like as we're, as I'm buying weed, I look at the ark and it just sticks out to me. It just resonates with me. And I feel a comforting feeling with the ark. And I mean, I thought that was a little weird and I noticed it, but I just like kind of moved on. Now, also during this time where I lived in Ohio, we were getting a ton of rain. And this was like an, an unusual amount of rain back in 2017. There was a huge flood in Ohio and that came through our hometown 
and I remember floodwaters were coming into my house and I was trying to save my room from getting flooded. I was like pushing water out of my room. And for some reason, as I was doing this, I felt like a spiritual feeling behind it. Like I felt like God was reminding me of the ark that I had saw a couple days before and the flood that was happening. And I don't know why, but I was like, that's weird. I haven't thought of like that Bible story in forever. I don't know why I'm thinking that right now. And I just continued to try and throw water out of my room. And after that, there were even more things that I felt were flood related or flood associated that just kept popping out to me for whatever reason. Like there was a tapestry in one of my rooms that looked like this. And it was a girl where there was a flood rising. And it was kind of weird because I always thought that this tapestry kind of looked like me. Like the whole time I had it in my house, I was like, it kind of looks like me, like as a, you know, fun thing. But then I was seeing it in a new light now. Like for some reason I looked at it and it gave me an eerie feeling now. And I saw it and it looked like there were floodwaters rising over who I like felt like was me and, and underneath the floodwaters it was like a skeleton and it was dying i'm just like okay why am i seeing things like this why am i like putting meanings to things that don't really have that meaning i just feel like i'm putting things together but i couldn't stop it just kept happening i was being bombarded with what i felt like were messages about a flood in my life and then a couple of days later kesha releases her song praying from her album rainbow and every time I turned on the radio, that song would be on, the, the song Praying. And I, I would just feel like for some reason it was penetrating me deeper than I thought it should. Like I was like, that's weird. Why is this Praying song speaking to me? And like even the album being called Rainbow, everything about it felt biblical. Everything in my life felt biblical. But the final tipping point was... One night that week, God gave me a dream. And in this dream, God was there and he showed me my soul, essentially. And it was one of the most vivid dreams I've ever had in my life. Like I was not even a dreamer back then. And and this dream like really woke me up to what was going on, realizing that this was God speaking to me, not just like me putting things together. But in the dream, God showed me my soul and he showed me that it was not doing well, that the state of my soul was not well, and that the enemy had my soul and it was dying, that my soul was dying and that I needed him to save me. I needed God. And once I woke up from that dream, that was when it hit me. It hit me that, yes, I am experiencing psychosis. Yes, I did too many drugs. Yes, I can't trust my own brain right now. I'm putting things together that don't make sense, but this made sense to me. This voice made sense to me. It was familiar. It felt like I knew him. I, I was remembering who he was. It was God's voice. It was God's voice calling for me to come home. And all he wanted was for me to say yes. And so I said, yes, I finally gave in and I said, God, I know that this is you that's been speaking to me. I'm going to say yes to you, but I need out of this situation. I need help. I need help. And as soon as I, I thought those words, I couldn't even say them out loud. I wasn't even strong enough to say them out loud. I thought that prayer in my mind. And as soon as I thought those words, boom, <laughs> everything started changing for me everything started changing for me. I, I was able to get out of that house. I was back in with my parents. I finally found a therapist that could listen to what I was saying without prescribing me, you know, medication. Not that there was anything wrong with that, but that's not what I needed. He saved me. He, he changed everything. He changed everything for me. And I know some people are going to say, well, that was just your psychosis. Like hearing God's voice was just another symptom of your drug induced psychosis. But then how do you explain how he healed my psychosis? Like God took away the confusion. God took away the depression and anxiety. 
God took away the bad voices as well. Like, I no longer hear the one telling me to kill myself. I no longer have hallucinations. I no longer am confused about how to operate my YouTube channel. Like, my mind is back and it, it's sharper than ever. And I feel so acute. And the one thing that's never gone away is his voice. Like, I still hear his voice to this day, even way after I've been healed from my psychosis. So how do you explain that? How could it possibly be a symptom of my psychosis if I still hear it, even now that I'm well, even now that I'm healed and I'm functioning well in my life? I have healthy relationships. I have, um, I have a career here on YouTube. I've, I've established so many amazing roots. Like I have, I have roots with my church. I, I'm a CEO of a company now, and I'll tell you guys more about that at another time. But like, I'm functioning, you know, I, like I'm clearly functioning well. I'm healthy. I've had doctors approve me and say, yep, you're completely good. You're good. But I still hear his voice. I still hear him talk to me the same way he talked to me that that day, that first day when he showed me the ark that I used to play on as a child, when he showed me the floodwaters, when he showed me my, my future, if I continued to walk down the path I was on, when he spoke those true words to me through my spirit, when he spoke to me and saved me, when I heard his voice clearly that day, I still hear it just as clear now. So to say that it could possibly be a symptom of my psychosis, I think is, is silly. Um, I have no other explanation other than the Lord came and saved me from my personal hell. Um, and that's what happened. And, and I, I don't know how to explain how he just divinely was able to, to align my path out of that place either. I mean, I was stuck. I was really stuck. I tried with all my power to get my own help and to, to leave, but it took him, his divine intervention to get me reconnected with my family, to, to get me into a new house, like a new place to live where it was crazy. Like, like I couldn't afford much. I couldn't afford much. And he found me a place for $500 and it was like a house and it was such a divine thing. And back then, you know, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. I did feel delusional. Even when I would hear his voice, I felt delusional. I felt like it was a part of my sickness, um, even though it wasn't. <laughs> I felt like I was still the crazy one, you know, and everyone else around me, this, this environment that I had built around me of people that weren't really my friends, you know, people that partied with me, like, they didn't believe in God. <laughs> I didn't believe in God and they didn't believe in God. So now, like, when I try and explain, I'm hearing God's voice. They're like, no, you're tripping. I felt crazy. And it wasn't easy to completely be uprooted from the shitty life that I had built for myself to start new. It was what I needed, but it wasn't easy. Looking back now, though, where I was headed would have been a lot worse. Where I was headed, I don't even know. I don't even want to think about that. So, and I was finally done hiding. I was finally done hiding my addictions from my parents. I remember one day, like, that after I had been reconnected with my mom and God was divinely, like, sending her to help me get out of this situation, like, I finally revealed to her everything about my lifestyle. She had no idea that I had even smoked weed. She had no idea that I had even smoked cigarettes at that time. I remember, you know, she knew that there was like a lot I was hiding. And I just remember being like, okay, mom, sit down. I'm here. I'm going to tell you everything. I lit up a cigarette right in front of my own mother. I sat in the chair and I was like, here it is. <laughs> and that was like when I bared my whole heart for the first time in my life. When I revealed everything I was hiding my whole life at that moment. It was so vulnerable and, and, and yet it was the most freeing thing I had ever done. Now, like I said, a lot of stuff changed after God came into my life. Like I was still 
you know, hearing his voice and everything. And like I said, the, the drugs that I had done had opened me up to the spirit realm. And then the psychosis on top of all of that, I was definitely overstimulated. And I felt like I was living my whole life, like in black and white. Uh, and then all of a sudden, after I had this experience with the Lord, I felt like everywhere I looked, life felt like it went from black and white TV to like 3D IMAX Technicolor. Like everywhere was so overstimulating because not only did I see the physical, like I was able to see the physical realm of what was happening with people, but now I was able to kind of see in the spirit. Like I was able to feel energies, like dark energies when they were around people. I, for the first time I started being able to sense when people had demonic entities tied to them. And it was a lot, like I couldn't be on my phone a lot. I couldn't listen to pop music. Like I, all of a sudden I just had to completely stop stimulating myself. Cause it was like, I was a newborn. I couldn't even process everything that, that I was experiencing. Like I'm sure a lot of born again, born again, Christians can, can relate to, especially the music thing. I used to be super into rap music and hip hop music. And then like all of a sudden, all of my favorite music just like, did not resonate with me anymore <laughs> like it just like i had to turn it off i couldn't even listen to it it just like whoa it was too much because it's so dark a lot of like not just hip-hop but a lot of pop culture stuff i had never seen it for the dark that it really was until now so now it was too much i had to turn off instagram because whoa that's that's dark energy i had to turn off the news i'm like shit, that's demonic <laughs> um i i remember i was like a newborn baby baby like I couldn't couldn't process things because it was just too much in the spirit um and that's something that I think like people that on, only people that have like been reborn in the spirit will be able to fully understand uh but it was it was a lot but slowly I was able to overcome the overstimulation and finally start to be okay with like okay maybe I'm in a grocery store and a song comes on that doesn't have like the most pure lyrics in it, right? And But like, I can still tolerate it. It's not gonna like trigger me or bother me. But about a month after when I believe I was reborn in the spirit, which is essentially when the Holy Spirit comes into your life and you experience that spiritual rebirth, which is like when God spoke to me and took me out of that situation and I allowed him into my life. That happened before I found Jesus, ironically. So the father is the one that saved me from the situation. And if you want me to make a whole video on like the father, son, and Holy Spirit, I can go into the Trinity if you want me to at a later time. But um, it's interesting because some people encounter Jesus first and that's, you know, who they fall in love with first. But for me, it was the father. And I think that that has a lot to do with my trauma with my father. So when I pray, you know, I don't really pray to Jesus because it was really the father that took me out of that situation and saved me. But um, of course I need Jesus too. And so the father gave me a vision one day about a month after, like I said, I was reborn in the spirit. And it was, it's funny because like the time that I would spend with the father, I would like go out and meditate because I didn't know what else to do. Like I wasn't going to church after this experience. I didn't like, I did not think about going to church. I was just like, oh, I just want a relationship with God. And I want to do that the best way I know how, which was meditation, <laughs> ironically. So I was meditating with God one morning and I got a vision of a cross burning. And I'm like, that's weird. Um, so I decided to Google it. Now, I don't recommend Googling Burning Cross because a lot of things will come up about cults and just negative things. So I'm just like, that's weird. That's definitely not what that meant, but I'm gonna hold on to this and see if it means something later. So later on that day, I was driving down a street in my hometown called Cherry Street. And I drove down Cherry Street every single day. It's, this is really funny. But for the first time this day, I noticed that there was a sign at the end of Cherry Street with a cross and a flame over it. And it was a sign, like a symbol for a church on Cherry Street. And I'm like, huh, 
maybe I do need to start going to church. <laughs> like that's when I was like, yeah, I feel like that's what my vision was from my meditation with God earlier. And so, yeah, I went to that church on Cherry Street and it was just a little chapel, but that's where I was reminded of Jesus. And they started talking about Jesus, this Jesus guy. And I did not know much. I just knew like the bare minimum, you know, I knew that Jesus was a pretty good guy. Like he loved a lot of good people or whatever. Or he was a good person and he died for our sins, even though I didn't really like recognize that as something for me, <laughs> but they were talking about it in ways that I'd heard before, but now it made sense. Like now the, when I was hearing it, when they were talking about how he had died for the sins of the world and and how I needed him to be with the father. Like I needed Jesus. I felt like it was true. Like I felt the truth behind Jesus. And I felt like this is the God that I need. This is the God that Christians talk about that, that saved me. And cause before when God saved me, I mean, I was kind of like, not even sure if it was the Christian God. I was like, I know it's God. I know it's the story from the Bible, from Noah's Ark that, you know, kind of like came forth in my mind, but I was still kind of like, well, it's just, you know, I'm not praying to spirit guides now. I'm just praying with God, <laughs> but it was Jesus God. It was, it was the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, and the father. And so I would find, I would find out later, like a couple months later that my future husband lived only two houses down from that church, who is Zach, as you guys know, and it's so funny how the Lord works that way. Like, what are the odds that my future husband just lived two, two doors down from that little chapel? But anyways, um, yeah, long story short, I, I ended up getting rooted in a completely different church in my hometown. Like my friend who was also a Christian um, invited me to a different church that was a little bit more like modern and upbeat, which was more my style. But even after that, even after coming to God, it still took me a while to completely stop with all of the new age things I had participated in. Like there were some things where God was slow to convict me. And I'm so grateful for that because like, it would have been way too much at once. I would have been so freaked out if I would have known like everything I was doing, you know, wasn't the best for me. Um, but slowly over time, you know, I stopped using the crystals. I stopped getting tarot readings. And then even, even after I stopped doing that, I would like slip back. I would go back to, to it. Even after I believed in God and I believed in Jesus and I received Jesus and the Holy spirit, I would still like dabble with some new age stuff. And it's funny because it's like the difference between the searching and the being found. It took me five years for God to really show me how to stop searching for wisdom. Instead, I, I am found in his love. I need to remain found in his love and, and resist the urge to keep searching for new wisdom. And I think that's what it comes down to. You know, like I said, I keep, I keep walking on this path. And even though I stumble and I fall because we all do like, all of these things that I'm mentioning, I really don't feel like are individually harmful. I feel like, like crystals are pretty, you know, they're from the earth. Like there's no harm in them. Right. And that's like how I justified holding on to them in a way. Cause they're not, you're right. They're not harmful inherently by themselves, but also it's like, but why do you have them? You know, are you searching or are you found? And as you guys know, like same thing with the Zodiac signs. I always felt like Zodiac signs were fun. Like they weren't harming anyone. It was fun. Yeah. And, and no, it's not. But at the same time, why, you know, like spiritually I'm found in God's love. And so that's what I'm about. And, and I'm instead, instead of just believing in God, I'm trying to follow God. And there is a difference between the two. You can believe in God and still, you know, practice zodiac signs or get angel card readings and, you know, if it's all positive and love and light. But then when you're truly following God, you never get hungry for anything else. You never search for a filling outside of him and his word. And that is what I was missing. Now, like I read the Bible 
when I feel that, when I feel hungry for something, for wisdom or for <laughs> to feel like I want to know more about his character, like I turn to the Bible. I, that That's what I do. And, and that is not something that someone could have forced me to do. Like if someone, some pastor somewhere would have said like, you got to stop doing zodiac signs and tarot cards and you got to read the Bible. That would have never gotten me to where I am now. Like, I feel like I would have resisted that and I would have wanted to say, no, screw you. <laughs> like, even after, if I believe in God, like, I, I I just don't think that this energy or this love, I guess, is something that could be forced. Even, like, people watching this video, nothing that I say in this video can force you to want that, to want that relationship, to seek him through his word. But it's an inspiration from the Holy Spirit. So on that note, I want to finish this video with one final verse. And I think like this is the verse that has really been strengthening me through being more open on my channel about my relationship with the Lord. And it's Galatians 10, 1, Galatians 1, 10. Obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. If pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. And I think like this is resonating with me so much because like Jesus is not popular. I mean, I, a lot of people think like, oh, being a Christian is like just the popular mainstream thing to do, but it's actually like one of the most countercultured things that I've ever done. So me being more open on my channel is a product of me being more vulnerable and me being more raw with you guys, because this is who I am in real life. Like I've said in previous videos, I'm not making bullshit content anymore that is just going to make me as much money as I can make. I'm not, you know, I'm not getting censored because now I'm trying to make my money elsewhere. Like I'm not going to let a wall, an invisible wall get between who I really am and my channel and you guys. And you guys deserve to know who I really am because you're subscribed. Like <laughs> you need to know who you're subscribed to. And if you miss the old content, if you miss the old Natalia Taylor, then I just have to say, like, that's okay. And there are plenty of other people, other influencers out there that are like that, that are like the old Natalia Taylor. But there aren't many that are like this, that are going to tell you truth and tell you how it is. So I really hope that you continue to stick around and... I really hope that you know my heart and you guys like that have been subscribed to me for so long, you know my heart more than anyone. My heart is never to force religion on anyone. My heart is always to love everyone to the deepest level that I possibly can. And some are going to see it and some aren't and that's okay. But this is the conclusion to my testimony, how I went from new age to Jesus and I thoroughly hope you enjoyed it. If you have any other recommendations on spiritual videos that you want me to make, I can dive into any number of topics and I'll also be responding to spiritual questions down in the comment section. I would really appreciate it. All right, thank you guys for watching. I thoroughly hope you enjoyed and most of all, I hope you have a wonderful, beautiful day. God bless you guys.